welcome back. In the previous episode, we took a look at three different types of memories. Uh, we took a look at electrostatic or Williams tube memory, we took a look at rotating drum memory, and finally we took a look at magnetic core memory. And all three of these memories were very fascinating, amazing pieces of uh, technology in their time, but they weren't going to work for us due to various reasons, most notably space restraints and or voltage restraints. Uh, but also in the comments there was a ton of fantastic uh, ideas or suggestions for other types of vintage memory that was used. Uh, most notably was delay line memory. And delay line memory is very cool. So we'll take a short aside here to explain what it is. Uh, as I understand it, it is essentially just a giant loop of wire that takes a certain amount of time for a pulse to travel down. So if I put an electrical pulse on this end of the wire, it takes uh, two microseconds or whatever for that pulse to make it to the other side of the wire. And so I can put a train of pulses into one side of the wire, and I know exactly how long it's going to take for that same train of pulses to come out the other side of the wire. And in this way, we create a loop of pulses, and that is our memory. So as the train goes by, we say, okay, I want to read the uh, eighth bit. So we read that eighth bit. If we need to change the eighth bit, when that loop comes by again, we change the eight bit and send it right back into the loop of memory. Um, but I just don't think that I have the ability to build that. Uh, the amount of precision that is required to read the train of pulses as it zips by and pull the bit out that you need or change the bit that you need to change is I think a bit beyond my engineering capabilities, but it's still a very cool piece of memory. Now there was one other piece of memory that was mentioned quite a lot, and that is using neon bulbs. And uh, I'm, I'm going to gush about neon bulbs for a bit because neon bulbs are just, they're like the 555 timer of the 1950s. They can be used for anything. Uh, they exhibit a certain amount of hysteresis. Uh, so in order for a neon bulb to turn on, for example, you need to have uh, 80 volts of potential. But then once the neon bulb is ignited, it will stay on until the voltage drops all the way down to about uh, 60 volts or so. And we can exploit that to build memory out of it. But neon bulbs don't just stop there because they also exhibit negative resistance, which means that the higher potential we put on the neon, the less the resistance inside of it becomes. This way, neons can be used to regulate voltages. Uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Neons can be used to make A-stable multivibrators, bistable multivibrators, monostable multivibrators. They can be used to make sawtooth generators, all sorts of unbelievable cool things can be done with neons, that there's actually a lot of fantastic information and documentation out there about just building circuits with neons. Um, but that is not the topic of today's video because, well, if you noticed, I said 60 volts and 80 volts, and that is a lot more voltage than we have available on the vacuum tube computer. I'm trying to keep the maximum potential at any given point across the entire computer below 36 volts because I'm using plus 24 volts and minus 12 volts. So the maximum potential there is 36 volts. Uh, so 36 volts isn't enough to ignite neons. Um, and so while I am definitely going to do something with neons in the future, it's just not going to work for the uh, vacuum tube computer project. And that leads us up to this. I uh, teased this just a little bit in the previous episode and uh, I'm going to tease it again. <laughs> Kind of. Uh, what I want to do today is I want to take a look at different types of SR flip-flops that I experimented with that ultimately led up to this design. Now this design is not just an SR flip-flop, it's actually a D flip-flop with a little extra control on it, um, but a D flip-flop at its heart has an SR flip-flop in it, and an SR flip-flop is essentially one bit of memory. So I uh, went through quite a lot of different revisions and ideas and tried a lot of really weird radical things, and well, <laughs> they didn't really all work out as I'd hoped, but they did lead up to a design that is going to work. So I have four designs that I wanna show you guys today, so let's hop over to the bench and take a look at those. 
All right, here is the first type of memory that I thought about using and uh, I just, I never really got there, uh, but it's a pretty simple design. Now in the schematic here, I have drawn it using an LED, uh, but in reality, I was planning on using a VFD or a vacuum fluorescent display. And in particular, I was planning on using either the IV25 or the IV26, and these actually don't have a grid, but they have a lot of different anodes right next to each other, so I thought that I could potentially make this pretty compact. Uh, but the way that this works is that we essentially have a voltage divider being created by an LDR and a resistor. And then we tap off from the voltage division point right in the middle and feed that into the VFD. And what this does is it creates a feedback loop. If the light source is off, the resistance through the LDR is high, which pulls the middle point down low, keeping the light source off but the second that the light source is on, it influences the LDR to go to a low resistance, which pulls that division point in the middle high, which then makes the light source even brighter, which then brings the LDR even lower, creating a feedback loop here that holds the light source on. And then we either set or reset it by just sending in a small pulse into the light source. So if the light source is off and we send in a uh, 24 volt pulse into it, that turns the light source on, which brings the LDR value down low, which will then hold the light source on. And then if the light source is on and we wanna turn it off, we pulse negative 12 into that point. And what this does is it essentially pulls the voltage away from the light source, which turns the light source off and the resistance of the LDR goes high again. Uh, so you can see here that on the breadboard that I have set up, it's actually a little more complicated than that because I have this big potentiometer here. And this potentiometer is adjusting the bias of this uh, 50K resistor that's in the schematic uh, to try and balance out ambient light. And that is the major issue with this design. Any ambient light changes the value of the LDR. And so to combat this, I put these uh, little metal covers over the LDR and the VFD, uh, but even that is not enough because the VFD has a curved glass to it. So enough ambient light can filter in that it affects the LDR. So even now, here in the room, I've got the blinds drawn on the windows to try and keep the ambient light level as low as possible, but it still won't latch. Even if I push the, the buttons here, I can see that it never turns off. The only way I can get it to latch is to actually cover it with my hand and block out any ambient light whatsoever. But of course, if I do that, you guys can't see the uh, VFD. So I've got my vacuum tube voltmeter here. We'll go ahead and hook it up to the anode of the VFD. Um, and then I will cover it with my hand here. Um, and you can see now we're actually latched off. So we're showing a voltage of about one volt here. Uh, and if I maybe get it adjusted just right here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, now we're latched on and we're storing a one at about, uh, I'm showing about 12 volts here. And then if I do a negative 12 volt pulse, we've latched off. So it is a functioning SR flip-flop. And if I turn all the lights off in the room, uh, it actually works without me having to cover it with my hand. Uh, but uh, th that leads me to the biggest problem of this, is that anytime the ambient light level changes, it'll either cease to function or it'll need massive recalibration. Uh, so there is a way, I think, to make this work, uh, but it essentially needs to be built into a black box and everything needs to be balanced very carefully. Uh, and well, that kind of defeats the purpose. I wanted it to be very visual. That's why I wanted to use vacuum fluorescent displays. Uh, so that was my first idea, but it didn't quite pan out as I had hoped, despite the fact that it looked very cool. Uh, so I moved on to another idea involving a Thyrotron. All right, here's the next idea that I had for creating an SR flip-flop 
as compactly as I possibly could, and that was to use a 2D21 Thyrotron. The reason I chose to use a Thyrotron is because they exhibit a latching behavior naturally. Uh, essentially, the tube is filled with a gas, uh, and the tube will not conduct until the control grid is brought up to a high enough level to allow enough electrons to flow to excite the gas. And when the gas gets excited, it turns into plasma. And that plasma essentially connects the cathode and the anode together, allowing a lot of current to flow through. But when this happens, the control grid is no longer part of the equation. The only way to stop the tube from conducting is to interrupt the flow of current through the tube. So in the setup that we have here, we have a 22,000 ohm plate resistor, and then the cathode goes through a diode, and then a 4.7 thousand ohm resistor to ground. Now if I push the reset button, that brings the grid to a high enough level to allow the tube to ionize and generate the plasma that will connect the anode to the cathode. And that brings the value of the anode, which is where we're reading our bit from, low. And then if I want to set it, I can press the set button. And this puts a strong positive voltage on the cathode, which interrupts the flow of current and allows the tube to deionize. When this happens, the tube is no longer conducting and the 22,000 ohm resistor pulls the value of the plate back up to 24 volts. And so I've got that set up right here. We have our 2D21 here, and I put a little uh, 6977 VFD over here, so that way it would be a little easier to see what's going on. And right now the tube is conducting, which is why our 6977 is off. So if I push the set button here, that interrupts the conduction. We can see that our 6977 has turned on, and that means that the tube is no longer conducting. And then if I want to reset it and get the tube conducting again, I just press the button here, which acts on the grid, and there we go. We can see our 6977 turned off, which means the tube is conducting. It is now storing a zero. And when the tube is conducting, the anode is low, and when the tube isn't conducting, the anode is high. Now, how low or how high is that value going to be? Uh, well, I've got my vacuum tube voltmeter here. We'll connect it up to the anode of our 2D21 here, and indeed, it's sitting at about 15 volts. Uh, so next, let's interrupt the flow of current, so that way the tube stops conducting. And yep, there we go. We can see our 6977 has turned on and the vacuum tube voltmeter is showing 24 volts. Now that spread of voltage from uh, 15 volts to 24 volts is not as wide as I usually like to use in the vacuum tube computer. I try to keep my logic low around about three to four volts. Uh, so <laughs> this is quite a lot higher than that. Uh, but I think with some level shifting and maybe some extra work, we could get that working fine. However, the bigger problem is with the 4.7 thousand ohm resistor that's going to ground. The 2D21 Thyrotron needs a certain amount of current flowing through it in order for the gas to ionize. And a 22,000 ohm anode resistor and a 4.7 thousand ohm cathode resistor is right on the bitter edge of the maximum amount of resistance that I can have in the total pathway there. So we need to have a relatively small resistor on the cathode, but the smaller the resistor on the cathode, the stronger the set signal needs to be. But a normal vacuum tube cannot supply enough current to this point to interrupt the flow of current through the 2D21 which means that I'm going to need a very strong buffer to buffer the set signal coming in. And at that point, I've added in an extra tube, which defeats the entire benefit of building this out of a 2D21, which was to try and keep it as just a single tube. Ugh. I really wanted to use the 2D21. I love the idea of Thyrotron based memory, uh, but from a overall tube standpoint, it was just actually going to end up requiring more tubes uh, than it would if we just built it conventionally. And speaking of conventionally, using a dual triode as our flip flop was the next type of memory I tried to build. 
All right, now we're looking at probably the most conventional solution to this, and uh, well, conventional solutions became the conventional solution for a reason, usually because they were the best solution. Uh, what we're looking at here is just an SR flip-flop built out of two triodes, and I'm using a 12AU7, which has two triodes in a single tube. Uh, so building a flip-flop with logic gates is relatively easy. If we try to make it as simple as possible, it's essentially two inverters with the output of one inverter feeding the input of the other, and the output of that inverter feeding the input of the original inverter. Uh, so if inverter one has a high output, that is a high input into inverter two, which holds its output low, which puts a low input into inverter one, holding that output high. Now this is a stable setup, but uh, we can't really change it. So if we put an OR gate before the inverter, uh, we still have the output of each inverter feeding into the input of the other inverter, but now we have an additional input into each inverter. And if we put a pulse into that additional input, uh, we can essentially override the output from the other inverter and cause things to switch. And in this way, we can cause the flip-flop to flip states based on external inputs. Uh, and that is exactly what we have set up here. Each triode has uh, two diodes feeding into the grid through a 220,000 ohm, 220,000 ohm voltage divider. Uh, one of the diodes is connected up to the plate of the other triode, and the other diode is connected up to either the set or the reset switch. And then of course we have a 33,000 ohm plate resistor where we're going to take our read value from. And that is exactly what we have set up on the breadboard here. So if we go ahead and press the button, you can see right there that is the set button which turned our VFD on. And then if I push the reset button over here, that turns the VFD off. So there we go, we have ourselves an SR flip-flop in a single triode. Not only that, this type of design gives us much better logic highs and logic lows. So if I hook up my vacuum tube voltmeter here with the 12AU7 tube that I'm using here with a 33,000 ohm plate resistor, we're getting a logic low of about uh, seven volts. Um, and if we reset it, then we get a logic high of about 23 volts. Uh, so we have a fantastic spread from logic low to logic high. And honestly, this was the design that I was intending to use. I actually sat down and started designing up PCBs to use a 12AU7 as a single bit of memory. Uh, but there are two large problems with doing it this way. The first is that, well, just using the 12AU7 as itself is not very visual. So I have to add an extra VFD over here, and well, that takes up additional space, even though it's still going to be pretty compact. Uh, but the other more important issue is that the 12AU7 is an absolutely brilliant tube that I only have a small handful of. And, the, well, I'm the 6AU6 guy. I have a 6AU6 t-shirt. I should be using the 6AU6. Uh, and it also doesn't help that I have, like, over 1,200 6AU6s. <laughs> uh, so... I kind of stopped design on this one and uh, through some pushing and prodding from some members on the Discord, Lucas, I'm looking at you, uh, I started working on a design that used the 6AU6 and I think we ended up with something pretty unique. All right, here we go. This is pretty much exactly what we just took a look at, only using 6AU6s, except uh, you'll notice that there's only one 6AU6 in use here. And that doesn't make any sense because the 12AU7 has two triodes in it, but the 6AU6 is only a single pentode. So how am I making an SR flip-flop using only a single 6AU6? Uh, well, I've been touting for the last two episodes that I want this memory to be very, very visual. So I'm using the 6977 VFD as my visual indicator. But the 6977 is not just a VFD like the IV25 and IV26 that we took a look at earlier because it has a grid. 
And if you have a cathode, an anode, and a grid, that means it's a triode. In this case, it's actually a directly heated triode. So the filament is the cathode. And while it was never really intended for the 6977 or the DM160 VFD to be used as a logic element, that's what I'm doing. I'm using the 6AU6 pentode as one half of our SR flip-flop and the 6977 triode as the other half of our SR flip-flop. This is ridiculous and absolutely should not work because the 6AU6 and the 6977 have wildly different characteristics. And in order for a flip-flop to, well, flip and flop, the uh, two elements need to be decently balanced. Um, and so I'm kind of brute forcing my way to that balance by changing the values of the anode resistor and the voltage divider resistor that goes to the grid. I had to bump the anode resistor all the way up to 100,000 ohms. But this means that we have far less current going into the resistor divider for the 6AU6. So in order to even get it to behave, I had to bump the resistor divider value of the 6AU6 up to 1 mega ohm and 1 mega ohm. Now the resistor divider for the grid of the 6977 didn't need nearly as much tweaking, but I did have to change it a bit in order to get it to behave. So we have a 100,000 ohm resistor and a 220,000 ohm resistor. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty much set up identically. And well, it does work. Let's push the button here. And yeah, I can see that the VFD has kicked on. Now you probably can't see that the VFD has kicked on because I'm using such a massive anode resistor on the 6977 that there's just not a whole lot of electrons striking the anode to get it to illuminate. But this is really only a problem in this scenario because I have a bunch of lights on in the room. In real life, it's actually decently visible. Now we're going to take our read value off of the anode of the 6AU6. So let's hook our vacuum tube voltmeter here up to the anode of the 6AU6. Uh, and we can see the 6977 is on, which means it is conducting, which means the 6AU6 is not conducting. Uh, and we can see that it's sitting at just about 20 volts. And then if I push the button to reset it, we can see we go all the way down to about uh, one and a half to two volts. So we have a perfect logic low and a logic high that's close enough that we don't need to worry about it. And we managed to get an SR flip-flop with a visual indication using only a single 6AU6. And this is the exact design that I'm going to use. And this piece that I've teased a couple of times is this, it's exactly this. Now there's a lot more tubes going on here because there's a lot more going on to control that SR flip-flop. Uh, but the actual SR flip-flop itself is just this third 6AU6 here and the little 6977 right next to it. That is the SR flip-flop. The remaining three 6AU6s are for uh, X and Y selection and reading and writing. And well, read, write, and address and control is by far the most complex part of the entire memory build. And it's going to require a very deep dive into the logic that I had to do in order to get it to work. So we'll save that for next episode. Uh, but in the meantime, we hit a pretty large milestone in this episode. We figured out the exact one bit design that we're going to use to create our random access memory. So I want to thank you all so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.